So this is the approach leading into Raleigh's Storm Machine boat. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is one of the first levels of the game we made. And it has been gone over and over and over. And as, as the characters changed, as his jump length changed and jump height changed, this level got changed too. Right. And it's also sort of like the test bed for the lighting, right? Mm -hmm. Hokio, you did all the lighting in the game. Right. What kind of stuff was going through your head when you were making this level? Before I do any lighting, the artist, me and include other artists, we trying to get the uh, right color palettes, you know, get the uh, right uh, mood of the time. The main goal that I was trying to do for this game was not making it too dark, but you still get the sense that you're at the night time. Mm -hmm. Is it hard to do to kind of get a, a versatile set of colors going on to represent night, right. but not be kind of Las Vegasy? Right. As you can see, the game right now, the uh, other you have tealish um, shadow all over. That is our shadow. Most of the game uses black as a shadow, but we have a different lighting that can make the uh, um, shadow, we can choose the sh color shadow. We can make it pink, blue, whatever color, and we can give the intensity and stuff like that. So it's just a lot of time consuming, just trying which shadow is works the best with these textures. That was the uh, most time consuming was with the textures. Does it works well with the blue? You know, mm -hmm. if it doesn't, then the, we slightly change the uh, saturations or the, you know, um, the colors of the textures. We did a lot of process on those in this level. How many times do you reckon you went through this level and relit it? Maybe more than 30 times. Whoa. Yeah. That is intense. Yeah. Because the, uh, it's, we're dealing with the fog and the shadow and uh, the most important thing is the, uh, the brightness. If the game is too dark, um, everybody has a different uh, TVs, so it might look very dark on some other peop some people's TV, and it might look very washed out, you know, very bright. So that was very uh, challenging for me to making it, kind of getting it right, you know, um, the brightness. Mm -hmm. You've got a really weird setup here at work where you've got your computer monitor and then three TVs right next to each other mm -hmm. while you're doing your lighting. And it, like one is a bright TV, right. one's a normal TV, one's a dark TV. Right. The reason that we are that I have a three different set of TVs, the uh, um, I wanted to see the game with really kind of washed bright and also very, very dark. So my goal is a, uh, trying to make it all same uh, with those three different monitors, trying to get it all same uh, brightness and the colors. You may be saying this level is large, but <laughs> it is actually a third of the size of the original level. The original concept behind the original NPCs was to tie them to Alice in Wonderland. What was challenging in lighting this level, Okio? You have fire in here, you have multi-levels, oh, yeah, yeah. lasers. lasers. Yep. Okay, the lasers. hardest thing for this level was the, uh, you have two different kind of a set of mood. One is very cold. You start with cold, and the, at the end you get hot. So we have like a, we can only use one fog in this level. With actually for every level, so, so choosing the right color of the fog was very difficult to stay kind of same. I mean, keep it consistent with the other level. Right. right. So, Wasn't there an octopus? In, or was that in a long, long time ago? That was in a long, long time ago for this level. Yeah. Yeah. 
It was behind. It was behind. We were very door. sad when it was removed. Yeah. <laughs> it was, it was a, quite large. It was, a sad day. it was a huge octopus head, and you got to knock its eyes all, out, eyeballs out of its sockets, and knock its teeth out of its. And its eyes looked it. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It, it was pretty out. creepy, wasn't it? <laughs> and he had a bow tie. Our NPCs were all, were all kind of uh, formal, wearing formal wear. After doing the crankshaft level, we decided that it would be impossible to finish this game with levels that are that size. <laughs> so um, we decided we we were kind of in this mode where, okay, that was a that was a a regular big level, and we'll also do these smaller levels that are kind of bon like bonusy. And we went, wanted to do one that was you know, like just pretty much all secure, you know, as much security as I could put in. So this is this is kind of going to be a small small security level and it ended up being actually pretty large. Good, it's good, great size. Good, a good size. For security in the game, we decided to go with a kind of one free hit per system, I guess you could say, where they're kind of in sensor mode, they're yellow, they're in, and they don't actually cause a, cause damage to you if you trigger it, but it sets off the alarm and changes them to a damage you know, this kind of red damaging state. And we primarily did that, you know, for inexperienced players to to give them an extra, you know, a, an extra chance to get through uh, instead of just burning and just hurting them every time. And also because we like the idea of you running around while the alarms are blaring and you're, it's kind of, it's loud, it's, it's a little disorienting. It's something, if it Im immediately burned you, you would, a lot of people would probably, you know, like die then and wouldn't get that experience of running around while the alarms are blaring. So we thought that that was a good thing. So we, we, we switched to the kind of one free hit, I guess, per, per system. Being under, we were under really tight constraints the challenges of creating this environment. We, uh, one of our best traits is that we have a great way of communicating. So between the designer, modeler, and texturist, we made sure that whatever we were creating could get done in the time we had available. We really adjusted when we had to. We adjusted things in the model to work for gameplay. And then also before I did my final handoff, I really talked to the texture artist because he had like a limited amount of time and said, hey, this is what I did. You know, um, and I really tried to make it, model it toward him being able to texture it in a fast period of time. It also looked great. So it was really great. We really talked about it. And we learned a lot about our game designer process through this. We, After this, um, Rob started doing almost all the elevation in final, uh, didn't doing any turns. Mm -hmm. um, adding any ele elevation changes, and so it really helped the whole process along the way. And this is also our, I think, our last uh, last Lola had split oh. collision <laughs> versus like yeah. what you see on screen versus what you, like kind of the physics that you're running around on. So this this really was a transition. Yeah, yeah a transition from how we did levels, and I, it was. Uh, I think it, it really helped us helped us get in a position where we could finish the game. <laughs> yeah, totally true. We do we can do, we can do stuff fast, yeah. This level began with uh, just the the kind of mechanic of this wheel that you can interact with by by running on it um, and it's kind of one of the few more puzzly kind of elements in the game where it's not it's you know when you walk up to this thing it's not completely straightforward what you're supposed right. to do yeah it's not immediately obvious what that wheel is is used for so um, so you know getting in, in both these cases it's you know driving you know Running on it drives the animation of another, uh, something else in the scene, whether it's the hooks or the, the conveyor belts. Right. Um, and I don't know if is there 
I know you've done some rigging in here. Yeah, yeah, I had uh, I had actually had done the rigging on both of the wheels, and and so that was that was uh, a, a little bit challenging from the perspective of the of the conveyors, you know, the conveyors that we've got in the back wall there with regard to the uh, getting the getting the the textures to actually go with the speed of the conveyors. That was the challenging part of rigging this was uh, doing that work, but uh, most of the rigging just was driving the animation, changing the speed of the animation of the hooks going around, or um, changing the, the 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 particles of the steam coming out of the whistle. Mm -hmm. Right, and that's that's what the extent of the rigging was. The hot coals that roll down on the floor—it's something that I've stuck to my guns <laughs> on this. A lot of people didn't have have not liked the the hot coals oh, because I, I think they're great because it's kind of this random thing. It's not something it's. To, totally easy to predict, even though the floor has been modeled with kind of this, these dips to really, you know, they pretty much, they're, they're real physics, but they're they're go, going down a pretty similar path just because of the shape of the floor. So. It's kind of a valley there that takes it right down to the grating and then right. back around again. We're kind of actually moving, when the coal gets to the bottom of the shaft, we just move it to the top where it, where it comes out of. Yeah to respawn it, so it's kind of like a uh, transporter or something like that. Mm -hmm. And at one time, instead of the clues, we had these bags of loot that would, you could, you could, they would roll on the ground. And it was funny, you would break like a safe open and this bag of loot would come out and it would roll down this hill because it's all designed, it's designed for these coal to roll down. And then it would fall down the chute and then the money would come out, <laughs> out of the chute where the coal's coming from. So it was, it kind of revealed exactly how we how we were doing this. Yeah. I can imagine a, a a player seeing the loot going down and going, "Oh no, I just <laughs> lost it!" And then looking at the the shoot, and there it is popping out. <laughs> This is another one of these levels where actually the key is available right at the beginning. You can see where it is. It's a little, yeah. a little small, but um, but still the key is right on this ledge, very very close to that main, uh, that first elevator when you go in. And so you're going to end up going into the level and coming kind of coming all the way back out on a on a different level. Brian actually did some initial like kind of level layouts for for this. Yes. Um, and that's what got me started in the kind of really double deckering yes the game the game path in here and we did that in other places too but and but yes. this was like the first where we really this did a of, serious double decker yeah um different types of kind of challenges on the top and the bottom and right and hoagie also did on the the texture maps for all the npcs kind of you really unified their kind of visual style in a, mm -hmm. in a really good way the main uh problem for our uh, levels. I mean, uh, my goal is a, uh, to making it not dark, but give it give it a uh, the night sense, and especially like this level is the interior, but uh, you still get the, uh, the night light. So it was pretty difficult for me to do the uh, lighting at first. Was there, I know we've changed lighting models, Three times? Uh, three times. Uh, <laughs> right, right. So each time you got to learn the new tricks of the new lights and then right. change, change, change all those out. Right. That was <laughs> kind of difficult at first, learning through the uh, new, new lighting system. Mm -hmm. But it really uh, helped the visual since we have the, uh, the shadow. Um, most of the game doesn't have the shadow system, so shadow turns to just a black they cannot make it to the colors. And uh, thanks to our programmers that uh, made it happen. Um, when you when you collect the key on this level or any of the other levels, um, you'll notice that the background kind of completely goes dark. And we kind of go into this letterbox and show you the show you this animation of Sly picking the key. And it's, it's kind of funny, we use this alternate lighting model to, uh, to darken everything else at this very base level. It was a weird kind of 
just hack feature I put in to, to just darken everything. <laughs> but then you have to say, well, I don't want to darken Sly because he's the one collecting the key. So Sly is actually marked as like, don't darken me, but he's the only thing in the whole game that's marked that way. Oh, and the key is marked as don't darken me. But uh, <laughs> everything else in the game gets darkened um, by the by some by this alternate lighting model when you when you collect your keys. So this started off as a puzzle um, where you were going to come to the end of this boat deck and actually the front, the top of the boat deck where the first starfish throwing NPC now is, um, was going to be the training section. Um, and the idea was going to be that there was going to be invisible lasers all over this area and you were going to have to spray something into the, uh, ahead of you to expose the beams, either smoke or frost or something uh, in front of you. And uh, so it was actually laid out very rectangularly and, and there were all these uh, things to jump on, these floating platforms to jump on and you had to kind of, each time you did a jump, you had to kind of look around you with the, for the invisible lasers and then make your next jump. Um, and as we backed away from the, the puzzly, slower gameplay, that was the first idea that went away. Yeah. So then, then what came? Well, there was also the idea of once you got to the rear set of the, the buoys that floated on the water, that there was a giant fish that was sitting below Oh yeah, you. the giant fish. And he was the one that paced you and made you want to move forward faster and get through the level, or otherwise he'd come up and gobble you up. Yeah, so the giant fish, he, he got cut. Giant fish got cut. We definitely learned a thing or two about physics engines and games. How? Oh, yeah. The predictability of something animated over relying on the physics engine to work itself out yeah. is usually... <laughs> yeah, the physics engine tends to work well in, in really clean, isolated situations yeah. or in shrapnel or in other situations where you want good-looking sort of ambient animation but not as good for stuff that has to work 100% of the time, right. super predictably. Um, and then I think environmentally, I think this was one of our our first levels that really had a good kind of, um, I don't know, misty, really rich kind of textured feel to it. You know, the fire on the side, right. which you can see from outside and the approach even. Um, All the like the moss hanging off of yeah. everything and just the kind of... Yeah, a lot of really kind of organic richness in this level, especially back, you know, when there was fish and all that stuff, the waters, you know, being space warped and, you know, has some interesting stuff going on and, you know, all the surface effects that the texture artists put in, all really, I think, made this a really good looking level um, and one that we kept investing in because it was something that, you know, the surroundings were so appealing that we wanted to make sure we, we used it uh, yeah. in, a, in a really constructive way. The uh, wisps floating through the air and whatnot, but with the fire in the background, brought out a great richness in the environment. I remember when I first loaded it into the world after it had just gone through this massive change, and it was just one of the most spectacularly beautiful levels that we had at the time. Uh, it, it was just exciting to go back and, and play uh, through it. Uh, 